שלום חברים, איתנו היום ג'יי בילאס uh, מ-ESPN, הכתב והמומחה ל-NBA, לדראפט, לקולג'ים, שיביא את הידע שלו על הדראפט הקרוב עם דני אבדיה, עם כל שאר הפרוספקטים, uh, ויאללה בואו נתחיל. היי ג'יי, תודה רבה שאתם מבינים אותנו. תודה רבה שאתם מבינים אותנו, זה טוב להיות איתכם. תודה רבה. Uh, so Jay, um, we would like of course to get a brief about all of the top prospects on the upcoming draft, but of course we want to emphasize Deni Avdia and we want to know where do you believe Deni Avdia uh, will be the best fit uh, and which team will benefit the most if they pick him? Well, I think Deni is such a, a skilled player uh, that he'll thrive anywhere he goes because he knows how to play and, uh, and plays very well. Uh, with others. He's not a player who would thrive just in isolation uh, basketball. Uh, you know, he moves very well without it. Uh, he can create with the ball uh, and his skill level is, is really fantastic. So it's not a question to me of fit or where he goes. I think he'll thrive anywhere. Uh, and my, my belief is that Denny will get drafted anywhere from four uh, to eight uh, in the NBA draft. I think the, the first three uh, looks pretty solid with uh it's not it's a question of, of where they go one two or three but but the top tier uh seems to be you know you know james wiseman anthony edwards lamello ball and then i think uh, uh denny has a, a very good opportunity to go right after that do you think um denny's draft stock is rising mainly because of also luka Doncic's insane success lately on the nba that this make any impact on teams to To pick Denny Avdia? Yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, Doncic has been such a transformational talent. I don't think uh, anyone is really saying that they think Denny is as good as Luka. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, things tend to go sometimes in trends. Uh, but, but things are different now than they were you know, 20 years ago with regard to international prospects in the NBA. Uh, they're scouted extensively and really the only faction that doesn't really know the international players are NBA fans. Uh, everybody else, like the, the scouts know them backwards and forwards and they oftentimes can see uh, European international prospects more than they see American prospects mm -hmm. at times. It's just not your entire scouting staff will have seen international prospects. You've got, you've got uh, scouts that are dedicated to that Uh, in addition to scouting U.S. prospects. What are the adjustments you think Denny Avdia needs to make in order to be more NBA ready? Because we believe Denny has a certain skill and he also comes a little bit more experienced, uh, we can, if we can say it, comparing to college players. Uh, we saw it also on how much Luca came as a mature player into the NBA. Uh, but what do you think are the weakest points in Denny's game that he needs to uh, step up and be prepared for the next level? I think like any uh, 19-year-old player anywhere in the world, uh, having your body mature, getting stronger uh, is going to be a, a factor. Mm -hmm. Because even though you know, people will tell you the NBA is not as physical as it used to be, it's still physical. And so you have to be able to, to handle uh, sort of the physical challenge of being the NBA. And I think Denny can really improve his shooting consistency, not just from the field, but from the free throw line. Uh, I think he can be a much better and much more consistent shooter than he is right now. Uh, and he'll, he'll certainly have to continue to improve as a defender. He's still a very young player, but very accomplished for, for his age. And I think is, you know, more NBA ready Uh, with his experience level than, than the young, most of the young players that are coming out after one year of college. What, the, what is the perspective in America for Denny's ceiling and comparing to his floor? Because even though Luka Doncic uh, made an amazing, um, let's say, mindset change on the uh, European basketball, um, there are still a lot of player who came up and with a lot of hype and turned out to be bust. What are the perspective from the American side? How do they um, get the version of Denny? Yeah, I don't think anybody that I've spoken to looks at Denny as, as having a potential for, for failing in the league. He's going to be a good player. Mm -hmm. The question with Denny is how good? Uh, you know, and I don't, I don't think any reasonable person is expecting him 
uh, to be as good as Doncic, frankly, because Doncic has been a savant. And, uh, and if he stays healthy, he's going to be one of the great players really to ever play in the NBA. Uh, and, and certainly given what he's done thus far, and it's, it's only been a couple of years. Uh, but I think Denny has a great opportunity. He reminds me a little bit going way back of, uh, of a player I played against in college named Detlef Shrimp, who played for a long time in the NBA. Mm-hmm. And uh, another, another 6'9", 6'10", very skilled player that that was one of the first sort of point forwards back in the day you know he played back in the 80s and 90s uh and so i had to go i had to go pretty far back to grab that <laughs> comparison uh but but then he's going to be a very good player and and you know the, again the question is just how good so to me the floor isn't the issue it's really uh, how high is his ceiling what teams do you expect in the upcoming lottery to be more aggressive um, on the trade side? Who do you believe? We hear, we hear a, lot of, a lot of rumors uh, regarding Golden State to uh, trying to explore a trade down. Um, what team do you expect from the late lottery or playoff team to try and push up to get a higher draft pick, maybe pick Denny or just moving up? Well, I think there are a lot of teams that would be interested in moving up. It's just a question of what you have to give up. And if you've got numerous picks in this draft, especially uh, mid to late first round picks, early uh, to mid second round picks, those are valuable commodities. So, uh, I, you know, look, I expect all the top uh, teams that, in, in the, that have lottery picks to look to trade uh, just to see what's out there, whether you can get for Golden State, if they can get, Um, a veteran player that helps them win now in the window they have with uh, with Clay Thompson and Steph Curry getting back healthy, uh, that that would be preferable to having to bring along a young player. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just depends who it is. Um, you know, I think James Wiseman fits very well for Golden State if he's still there picking at number two. Uh, but if I were a- any of the teams, it doesn't matter, Minnesota, you name it, Charlotte, Uh, you would look to try to leverage those picks to turn them into more assets mm-hmm. uh, because in in this draft after the the top tier and a few other players you may really like there's a similarity among players as far as uh, it, it's deep of good prospects it is not a draft that that is like 2003 or something like that when mm-hmm. you can look at these guys and say okay there there's a number of potential Hall of Fame players uh, I think I think you I've not heard anybody uh, make that make that stretch well, for this draft it, it, it's it's got good depth of good prospects but it's not got the kind of depth of, of great prospects that we've seen in some of the past drafts mm-hmm. it's inter- interesting you're mentioning it because uh, the next topic I wanted to talk to you about is a little bit about the other prospect that's supposed to be the top prospects in the draft because as it seems now the the Besides the top three, let's say Edwards, uh, Wiseman and Ball, it seems like a very balanced um, draft. Uh, the prospects will go mainly um, of uh, team need more than uh, you know the best uh, player on the board because everyone I, I want uh, I will say same level. Um, why won't you talk a little bit about uh, tell our uh, fans what uh, what do you find special on Edwards Wiseman Lamella ball Okoro maybe Obi topping the other top uh, prospects in the upcoming draft well to start with Anthony Edwards of Georgia I have him number one overall as a prospect uh, you know he's he's a young player uh, one year of college at the University of Georgia and he is he reminds me a little bit of Eric Gordon who Uh, and he was coached by Tom Crean, who also coached Victor Oladipo and Dwayne Wade in college. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's probably the best athlete, best build, 6'5", can really score, but was not as efficient as he needed to be. He needs to learn how to play, really. Uh, shot selection, not great last year. Uh, I thought he could have spent more time at the free throw line because he is so big and strong and so athletic. I thought he settled for jump shots a lot. And he's not an engaged defender, frankly. He doesn't defend uh, with the same vigor that he plays with at the offensive end. Uh, so he's going to need to improve upon that. You can't be a one-way star in the league. You've got to mm-hmm. play at both, both ends of the floor. Wiseman, if this were 10 years ago, James Wiseman would be the first pick in the draft and it wouldn't be much of a discussion. But since the game has changed so much with it being more perimeter-oriented, I think Wiseman's going to have to prove that he can knock down a consistent perimeter three. Uh, and be a stretch five. 
but uh, he's he's a, a great talent. And I, I, I think one of the things that may be, you know, holding holding me back and maybe others from ranking him number one is he didn't have a full season of college ball. Like he only played three or four games and that was the end of it. He quit because uh, he got suspended by the NCAA for over a money issue. Uh, but he, he seven, one, seven, six wingspan reminds me a lot of Chris Bosch when he came out of Georgia tech and then LaMelo ball is a little bit of a puzzle. Uh, there are those that will tell you he's the most talented prospect in the draft because he's a, he's a, a wonderful passer Mm -hmm. uh, has positional size as a point guard, six eight, six seven, six eight, uh, a fantastic handle and uh, incredibly creative. Uh, not only with the ball, but passing, finding people, transition, you name it. Uh, does not defend at all, and that's something obviously that's going to have to change. And he's not a particularly good perimeter shooter. And in today's game, like I think you, he he can certainly improve upon that shot. But I don't see him being an outstanding shooter. Uh, but, you know, maybe he'll prove all of us incorrect in that. And then I think that was an interesting point you made about uh, raising I Isaac Okoro of Auburn because mm -hmm. Okoro, I think, could be a top four pick as top well four. as Denny because he's got – yeah, I do. Because he, um, he can really defend. He's an excellent offensive rebounder, uh, passes very well. Uh, his issue is with all the things he does extraordinarily well that would make him a, a, a top five pick, not a great shooter. And that's something he's going to have to improve upon. And then I think the last one you mentioned was Obi Toppin, whom if the season had had continued into the NCAA tournament, I think he was he was going to be the national player of the year and had a, had a real chance to take Dayton, I thought, to a Final Four. Uh, Toppin is sort of a, an Amari Stoudemire type prospect. Uh, very athletic, uh, really runs the floor well, and uh, and can knock down uh, a perimeter shot. He was incredibly efficient during the course of the year, uh, but it, there are some questions about his defense. So, you know, can he guard pick and roll? Uh, his lateral movement, can he switch on a, a smaller player? Things like that. Uh, but but he's a he's a very good prospect that I think won't last much longer than than six or seven maybe. That's in interesting. I really like the comparisons uh, you made here. Um, Okoro reminds me a little bit, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, uh, type of player that if he will develop um, a good three-point shot, would be, would be could make a very big impact on this league, which is going straight into the three-point line. Every Each and every prospect here uh, the one thing that each and every one of them, and you mentioned it, uh, should improve uh, is, is the consistency beyond the arc. Um, the next prospect I want to talk to you about, who is um, really making a lot of interest here in Israel, is Yamadar. Um, we are hearing him playing in Vegas and uh, meeting... Um, we, we are hearing rumors regarding Philadelphia 76ers or Brooklyn second round pick. What, are you think, what do you think about the odds of Yamadar to actually get picked in the upcoming draft? I think he's got a very good opportunity to be a second round pick, as you mentioned. But the, the, the good news is for a number of prospects, Madar included, is if you're not selected in the draft, uh, if you're going to be, a, you know, maybe a mid to late second round pick and you're not you're not s selected, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that can be a blessing in disguise because mm -hmm. then you get to choose where you go. And uh, and oftentimes looking for the right fit can be really helpful rather than being locked into somewhere that might not be the best place for you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you always, you always say, I mean, I know it's disappointing on draft night for a player uh, to go undrafted, but there are, there are so many uh, different examples of players that were not drafted uh, that are able to sign a free agent deal and go where they're needed uh, mm -hmm. or where they're wanted uh, like that and, and have an impact. Uh, and now with all the two-way contracts, um, there are a lot of different avenues into the league. So uh, I wouldn't get too hung up, not that you are, but I wouldn't get too hung up on, on sort of the second round pick versus undrafted free agent there. Are, you know, Madar's a, a very good prospect and he's got, a, a, I think, an opportunity to, to play in the league for a long time. I actually completely agree with you. I think um, not getting picked might not be so bad because, like you said, he can go and he, can, he could 
go into training camps with several teams and um, get chosen where he uh, where he chooses and where the team wants and needs him um, let's talk a little bit about you you tweeted uh, I think it was a few months ago uh, that it's ludicrous to say that uh, players today won't be able to dominate on the 80s and the 90s after the last dance um, I actually completely agree with you uh, on this point because I think players especially physical players like LeBron James uh, Westbrook um, and even the skiller the, the, the skilled ones uh, you know KD, Kyrie, I think they would be relevant in any era. And I would like to hear, hear a few words from you. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think I'm 56 years old, so I played college ball in the 80s and I played in Italy for a few years professionally. You and I've Michael, been around right? the game my whole... I'm sorry? You played against Michael, right? Yes. Yes, I did in college. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think... You know, guys my age like to talk about how great the 80s and 90s were. And and it was. It was great. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so so they'll argue that, well, the players back then were better than the players of today. We were more physical, uh, more, you know, more competitive. Uh, the games were fist fights and all, the, all these things. But if I had said to my, my group of, or sort of my generation said, uh, well, you know, the players of the 60s were better than we were, they would have said, no way. What are you kidding? <laughs> Like, there's no way they could have hung with us. <laughs> it, it's absurd to suggest that the, the players... Now, you can say Jordan was the best player ever. That, not, I'm not going to argue that. The, mm -hmm. the, great, the greatest players would be great in any era. Uh, you can take the great player, the greatest players of the 80s, they'd be great now. You could take the greatest players of, the, uh, of now and put them in the, the 80s, and they'd be great then, too, or the 90s, whatever. Uh, you know, greatness transcends this kind of thing. But generally, the players today are better than they have ever been. Mm -hmm. And and it's I, I just think it's laughable to suggest otherwise. And, you know, if, if you took the best soccer teams of today and put them the, against the best soccer teams of the 90s, they would blow today's teams would blow them out. Definitely. And it, it's like arguing. It's like arguing, uh, you know, Mark Spitz. Was a swam faster than Michael Phelps. You know, if the stopwatch were never invented, people would argue that nonsense, and they'd argue that, uh, you know, they'd argue that Ben Johnson was faster or Carl Lewis was faster than Usain Bolt. And it, it you know, you can look at all these things. It's it, the the athletes now are better than they've ever been, I, and I, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why we do that in basketball. Why we why we acknowledge that that athletes are, are better now and. You know, it's like arguing, man, you go back, the cars in the 80s were better than the cars. Of, no, they're not. I mean, that's, no, or the airplanes not. were better back then. No, they're not. They're not better. Yeah, uh, I, I, service I might have been better, but it's not, you know, the, 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 I, it I wasn't agree. better. I think it's because people tend to be nostalgic and, you know, yes. um, look look at the past like it was super amazing. But I, I agree that pe players today are more, more skilled. Uh, than they ever been because they had the time and the social media today, the media in general, to look at other greatness and to learn from them and to develop something beyond what they already watched. Um, so I, I actually agree. Um, in addition to that, you also wrote a book, right, called Toughness. Um, uh, there, there is one sentence that still sits in my mind that, that I heard you talk about the fact that toughness is something that you cannot define. Uh, the co coaches and staff to, in, in a team tell you all the time to be tough. Uh, they talk to you about toughness, but it's not something that you can actually define. In your book, you actually define it. Am I right? Define it again. Yeah, I, at least I tried to. And, <laughs> and you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid and a young player, uh, coaches all the time talked about toughness and being tougher, but they never really at least my team never really defined it for us. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of learned it over time, uh, what it what it meant. And I think with the perspective I gained and, and all the people that I, I talked to and researched the subject uh, with, uh, I was able to at least get my definition of it out. And, uh, and in, in basketball, mine was, you know, it was pretty simple. It was uh, the, the tough player is the one that's easy to play with and hard to play against. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it encompasses so many things about, 
uh, empathy and preparation and then uh, the ability to, to put what just happened in your rearview mirror and move on and to stay positive. Um, that, that's very much what it meant to me. And, uh, and I think when you focus on those things, uh, you're naturally going to be going to be better in the moment mm -hmm. uh, if you if you, you know, you think that way. All right, Jay, thank you very much for your time. It was really a pleasure having you here, and I hope we will meet again in the future. Thank you very much for everything. No, thank you for having me, and hope I hope you stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. You too, my friend. You too.